Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Assalamualaikum sir. Good morning. Waalaikum salam. Good morning. How are you? Fine sir. How about you? I'm fine, thank you. So I'm not sure how many students have registered for this course. I hope that few others will join, but I'm not sure about the total number of students. So did both of you uh, register for this course? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, because I can see only one of you uh, on the portal. Yeah, I, I registered today, sir. So maybe you will okay. get the dates. Okay, so, so that's why I, I don't know if everyone has this uh, link to uh, link to the Zoom link, uh, the Zoom meeting. Do you have any idea that any anyone else is uh, registered? No, but I guess uh, Sajjad has uh, emailed all the students. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's great. <clears throat> so I hope that they will find the link. Anyway, so uh, a friend is joining. So maybe. Hello. Hello, Abdullah. How are you? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you. So now we have three students. Great. Uh, so I think it's time we can start. Um, so let me let me pull our slippers. And from Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Okay, so this is our um, course outline and the syllabus for this course. And um, there are so many things in it and it's, it's a continuously evolving document. Uh, so I will upload this document on LMS today, sometime later today. And um, it contains so many things and I will go through most of them uh, here today now and there might be a few changes and updates that uh, we will make uh, during the semester and um, I will keep updating you uh, whenever there's any major or significant change in this document. <clears throat> so this course is CSE 581 computational complexity theory it's a brand new course here uh, at IBA and I'm also almost a brand new teacher at IBA it's my first regular semester at IBA um, and um, I, I taught one course during the summer, but that was a summer course. And you know, summer courses are, are not that uh, long and uh, involved. So this is my first course, uh, first semester at IBA as a regular faculty. And I recently joined uh, in summer. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a new course that I designed and, and we will be having this here for the first time. Um, this is an experimental kind of phase in a sense that um, I have taught this course before, and but this is the first time I'm teaching it here at IBA and nobody else has taught the same course at IBA, so we might face some, uh, I mean, beginners uh, uh, issues, and we will resolve uh, these issues on our way uh, toward this, uh, during the semester. Okay, so for first few things uh, about the logistics of the course. So my name is Shahid Hussain. And as I, as I said, I'm a new faculty at IBA. Uh, I have been teaching uh, for many years and um, I've taught this course as well. Uh, and, and my interests and research interests and uh, academic interests are usually around algorithms, design analysis of algorithms and computational complexity theory. So this is one of my uh, favorite uh, subjects and it is one of my favorite areas to work with. Uh, I love uh, studying and teaching uh, these ideas and courses. Uh, so hopefully we will have good time and we will learn together. We will learn some new things and uh, we will try to solve some uh, good issues, some problems. Um, as you all know that uh, we have to resort to these online classes for at least one uh, week, uh, starting from today, uh, going all the way till Saturday. 
And from next week, most probably, uh, uh, we will have uh, in-person on-campus classes. And, um, but the situation is very uncertain. Uh, anything can change at any time. Uh, so we should be ready for any such changes. And uh, if, uh, whenever there is any such situation, uh, we will come back to our online classes. Uh, the same link will remain uh, active. And we will meet uh, two times a week, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, the same time, 11.30 to 12.45. Uh, but when we are not meeting in, on Zoom, uh, from next week onwards, we will be meeting physically at, uh, at this classroom, MCC 13. Uh, I, I still don't know where that classroom is, so I will figure it out where it is. Uh, but we will uh, meet physically. Um, uh, hope, uh, I'm not sure how many total students we will have in this class, but uh, it seems that we may not have many students, but in any case, so if, if, if there are fewer students, um, that means we can, uh, we can have uh, more interactive sessions. And in during our sessions, during our classes, if you have any questions at any time, you can raise your hand, you can ask questions, or you can participate in, in the discussion. And uh, if, if that's not enough, or if there is some issue, you can always send me an email, uh, we can set an appointment. Or you can come to my office hours whenever I'm in my office. Uh, if you see I'm not taking any class or I'm not in meeting, you can just uh, open the door and, and come, to, come to my office and we can I meet. So my office is in Taba Center. It's room 204, second floor. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's North Wing or South Wing, but it's one of the places where other CS faculty members are. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what is this co course all about? And what uh, what we will be studying in this course. So the main objective um, in this course is that, that we will be tackling and talking about some of the core theoretical computer science ideas. Um, so as I, as, as I mentioned here in the uh, prerequisite session uh, section here, uh, the prerequisite for this course is theory of automata. So I assume that if you are coming to this course, then you must have done this course if you are coming from an from IBA, or you have done a similar course somewhere else anywhere in the world, which talks about um, computation, talks about automata, talks about theory machines, uh, and some maybe some things about uh, complexity, maybe a little bit. Uh, but you have some uh, good idea that what a computer is, what is computation. You have some ideas about Turing machines and abstract computational uh, models and so on. Um, but you don't have to be expert in it. And in, 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 even if it is rusty, uh, it's perfectly fine uh, because we will cover all those things in this class as well. Uh, but we will do it quickly. We will do a quick review of all of those ideas. And whenever we would need an idea which, uh, which is which has some prerequisite, uh, some some prerequisite baggage, then then we will cover in the class. Otherwise, I will uh, point you to the proper references where you can uh, read more and and you can get yourself uh, comfortable with that. So um, I I assume that you know about these things, but it's perfectly fine if if it's rusty or uh, you've forgotten something. We will cover those things. So the main objective is that that whatever that you study in, in theory of automata kind of things, uh, where we mainly focus our attention toward the computation part, uh, that what exactly is computation and what are the things which are not uh, computable. So we, our focus in that course is mainly about computation. But in this course, we will concern ourselves uh, about things which, are, which we already know are computable. Uh, but then we will think about that what is the efficient way of computing that? So, so mainly we will concern with problems and algorithms rather than the problem of computation itself. So we know that some problems is computable. Let's find out an efficient way of of, find, of solving that um, that problem. And once we solve different problems in with different efficiency, let's classify those problems into different categories and figure out that which problems are easier to solve, which are a little bit harder to solve and which are extremely harder to solve. And we will also tackle about the questions which are impossible to solve, but, but that usually goes into uh, the computational aspect rather than complexity. So with this, uh, this we, will, we will go through a breadth of topics and we will start our discussion from very simple uh, basic computational classes like class P, class NP, 
Uh, we will talk about reduction. We will talk about NP completeness, uh, NP complete problems, uh, NP hard problems, uh, polynomial hierarchy. We will talk about Boolean circuits. And uh, I have um, a significant portion of the course dedicated for the probabilistic or randomized computation. So what happens if we include uh, the uncertainty of randomized computation uh, into, the, into the computation? And then how does it impact the, the, these classification of problems into different classes? For example, if you have a problem which is uh, deterministic and we classify it in, uh, in, as, as a P problem, then what happens uh, when we have the randomized algorithm for one of the, one of the problems? Uh, what changes are there in the classes? What happens if the original algorithm uh, was not in P? Okay, so what happens, it was NP, and now we bring uh, non-determinism, not just in the, comp uh, I mean, not just in the uh, underlying Turing machine, but also in the, in the sense that it actively generates a random number to solve something. So we will start to see that how it impacts uh, this classification and how it changes uh, some hard problems into a little bit easier problems and so on. So, so a significant amount is dedicated to probabilistic or randomized computation and its corresponding computational classes that will also lead to the interactive proofs and some of the applications of interactive proofs, for example, zero knowledge and, and some of its applications are in, in, in cryptography uh, where it, it assumes some uh, uncertainty. So, uh, so these are the things uh, we will be covering uh, and specifically uh, the, the course learning outcomes for this, this course are that by the end of this course, uh, you would be, um, I mean, you would be able to distinguish different problems in different classes uh, and you will understand the mathematical complexity results for, for many different problems. And you will, and, and one of the most important objective of this course is that by the end of this course, you will be able to construct proofs, right? So the first part of constructing proof is to read or to be able to read uh, proofs. So we will do that in class. We will do several proofs, which are already standard proofs. And I will, uh, we will do those proofs in class. Uh, I will do partially, and then you will do the rest. Some, we start starting with that I do the whole proof. And then we will move to where I will give you an outline and you do the rest of the proof. And then we will come to a point where I would just tell you that uh, this is a theorem and I would ask you to construct a proof at your own, okay? And that will also be reflected in our uh, assessments uh, when we will have homework and quizzes and exams. Uh, most of those questions would be like that you need to come up with a proof. Initially, starting with, um, very basic, simple results. And as, as we progress, uh, we will increase the difficulty or the complexity of those results. Uh, so, so this is a theoretical course and we will be uh, doing a lot of proofs, okay? And there's one also, one more objective and that is we apply the results that we have learned in this, uh, in this um, course in some real world application or maybe some theoretical uh, things that we, we will come across. Okay, so the main textbook for this course is a graduate uh, book. It's Computational Complexity, A Modern Approach by Sanjeev Arora and Bose Barak. Uh, this book is available uh, online. You can figure it out how to find the PDF of this book. I'm not telling you where to find out, but you can figure it out. Uh, there's another book. Uh, I don't have the physical copy of this book. Uh, I have. There's another book called Introduction to Theory of uh, Computation by Michael Sipser. This, this book basically covers uh, computation aspect. So if you are interested, you can get that one. And the next book is Computational Complexity. I think this is the book uh, you may get from somewhere. This is also available uh, on, uh, online. <clears throat> uh, there's one more, Peoples and Ideas in Theoretical Computer Science. Uh, it's, it's an edited version. Um, that contains some biographical notes by prominent theoretical computer scientists of 20th century. Uh, it was published in, I think, 95 or 98, some, some, sometime that time. And uh, this, this contains very interesting aspect and it, it has uh, interviews, not uh, biographical accounts of uh, many top theoretical computer scientists of that time. 
Um, this is just uh, for fun. Uh, if you are interested in this area, you would uh, definitely love uh, reading some parts of that book. <clears throat> I have this book physically, a physical copy of the book. If you're interested, you can borrow it and maybe get some copies. Uh, anyway, uh, in, in this course, we will have several different uh, assessment uh, instruments. Uh, we, we will have some homework. Uh, we will have some quizzes and we will have exactly three hourly exams. And since this is, uh, there is this change from this semester onwards, and that is, um, we, it is possible that our classes remain online throughout the semester, but we would hope not that it doesn't happen, but it is possible. But even in that case, uh, these exams, the hourly exams will happen in person on campus by ensuring all SOPs and everything. Uh, so these will be in-person exams, which will happen on campus. And uh, we would have three such exams and I have announced uh, the dates, not exact dates, but I've mentioned which, in which weeks we will have these exams and uh, we will have those physical exams anyway. Uh, regarding quizzes, we would, I would hope that we would have these quizzes also as, uh, uh, as physical quizzes, I mean, in-person. Uh, but if we are not uh, able, then we will figure out uh, how, how to manage that. Um, and quizzes, uh, I will announce the quizzes maybe a week earlier. For example, if you have a quiz next week, then I will I'll tell you that we would have a quiz. So we have two classes every week, uh, a class on Monday and a class on Wednesday. So I will tell you by Wednesday that if you have a quiz on next Monday, right? So we would have at least five days between announcing a quiz. So we will have at least five quizzes, at most five quizzes. I mean, we may have like four or maybe three, but we would try to have as many as possible. And uh, these are the percentage uh, grade attached with all those assessments. Uh, there's one important component, which is a project. And this is for 15 marks. And this project, what do you have to do? Um, so since we are not many students in this class, so we can have one student per uh, per topic. And you would choose a, a topic of your uh, interest and choice, uh, which is closely related with uh, theory, theoretical computer science and specifically complexity theory or maybe computation theory, or maybe one of the applications of complexity and computation. It could be purely, uh, it could be purely theoretical or it could be application or it could be combination of both. So you choose a topic uh, and it is possible that it could be a topic that we covered in a class, maybe superficially, but you want to go into detail or it could be a completely new topic that we did not cover in the class. And uh, you research about it, you figure out that what is that problem? Uh, what are the problems in, in that area, that topic? What are some solutions and what, uh, what is the state of the art? And you'd prepare a report and then you will present your findings in front of the class. So it's 15% it's and it's an interesting part of the project because this way, let's say if you have 10 students, then probably we will, 10, we will learn 10 new ideas uh, in, in form of project presentations. And you also will need uh, to prepare a report and that report uh, uh, will be a formal kind of report because then, then you will write it yourself, you will uh, research, you, you'll, you'll conduct research. And it will be a good experience for you uh, if you want to uh, pursue, uh, I mean, a thesis or you want to go for a PhD. <clears throat> so, so these assessments. Uh, sorry, sir, I'm cutting off. Just wanted to yes. ask uh, if the project is something related to the field of complexity theory and we have to research on the topic and then present uh, in front of the class. Is that? Yes, exactly. So we are not uh, uh, any. We have no applic application to develop. We have to do any implement. We have to do any research. We have to research. We have to do any 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 research. Yes, but you mean by implement, you mean uh, coding, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, no coding. No coding. But if you want to code, fine. It, it, it depends what kind of project you have chosen, right? For example, uh, one possible project could be that you take, um, let's say, um, you take classification of some uh, problems into a particular class and you say that, okay, even though that problem belongs to NP, 
for most practical reasons, this problem can be solved by an algorithm uh, which is which has reasonable complexity. So, and and you show it by implementing and doing some uh, empirical analysis. So it is it's still perfectly possible that you uh, come up with an implementation uh, project, and that would be actually that will be a very interesting project. And I know some uh, for some problems uh, where the general solution where where the problem is generally in NP, uh, but for most parts. It is possible to come up with a solution which runs in a very reasonable amount of time, even for a very large instance of, of the problem. And in fact, there is another research uh, where we have some problems uh, where, which, which, which reside at the boundary of two classes. For example, if you add certain restrictions, that problem becomes in P, but if you lift those restrictions, that problem goes into NP. Um, so you can come up with that thing and you can either show mathematically, theoretically, or you can show it using empirical analysis. Uh, so I have a couple of papers uh, in, in that regard. For example, uh, we identified a problem uh, where we had some restrictions. We identified with some restrictions and we said, okay, if you lift those restrictions, this problem is definitely NP complete. Uh, but then you can start uh, having those restrictions one by one. And let's say one restriction still remains NP complete, one more NP complete, one more NP complete. And then you say that, okay, this is the last restriction that if you put there, this problem completely becomes a polynomial time solvable on a deterministic machine that goes into P. So we find such boundaries. So there are some problems which are at the boundary. So it is possible to examine that uh, area as well. <clears throat> So, so, मतलब हम खुद ही completely project के अंदर सोच रहे होंगे कि हमें किस चीज किस चीज को present करना है या किस चीज को किस चीज को research करनी है किस topic को research करनी है अगर आप कोई idea हमें देंगे मतलब specifically कि भाई इस चीज को देख लो इसको uh, it can it can go uh, it can work both ways for example I can provide you let's say if you if you have ten students then maybe I can provide you a list of ten to fifteen uh, possible topics or project ideas uh, you can choose one of them or you can choose any other topic that that you think is better for you okay okay uh, but if you if you choose one of the topics that i i gave uh, for example if i give a list of topics and you choose one of them it's it's fine but if you come up with your own topic then i have to uh, go through it and check if if uh, it has the merit uh, to be considered as a full project <clears throat> I hope that answered. Uh, anyway, so whatever instruments uh, we will use in, in, in this course uh, for grading and assessment, um, these, th these things are there for your own learning, right? So if there's a homework, um, if there's a project, um, these things are there so that you try your best efforts, right? So you, you should struggle. So when you are trying to solve those questions, for example, if in, in, in one homework there are, let's say, five questions, then maybe one or two questions are very easy. You can do very quickly. But there would be a couple of problems which will be challenging. I would not say difficult, but maybe a little bit challenging. So for those problems, for those challenging, tricky problems, uh, most probably your first line of thought will not be successful. So you will attempt a solution and it will not work. You will fail. You may have to think, uh, multiple times before you come up with a solution. And it is also possible that even after spending significant amount of time, substantial amount of time, uh, you figure out that it is impossible for you to think about a solution. And that's perfectly fine. If, if that happens, it means that you are in the right direction. And if you fail for the first time, that means you are in the right direction. Um, and that is all part of the learning process. So if, if you get a solution from somewhere, you search a uh, solution for the, on, uh, if you search online for the solution, or you get hints from uh, your peers or from outside the class or from anyone, uh, then you will not go through that learning process. So for, for learning, it is important that you do it yourself and you try it hard. And, and it's okay if you fail for the first time. It's, it's perfectly all right to fail for the first time. And once um, you, so uh, at the end of it, at the end of the struggle, you would either be successful and find your way to, uh, to, toward the solution, or you will come to a conclusion that maybe you need an extra help. But in any case, when you will come, for, come to me for, for help, uh, 
that will also increase your learning because then I will I will not solve that problem for you, but I will give you hints and ideas which will enable you to solve or look into a certain direction. So it is important that you struggle. It is important that you uh, probably fail in your first couple of attempts before you can uh, declare that you have a solution. So so if, if that's happening, that's that's by design, that's, that's a very good thing and you should uh, not worry about it. <clears throat> so where uh, many, some problems will be challenged, they would be tricky, right? Uh, then there's some uh, policy for the late work and makeup policy and you can read it up and uh, we don't have any, I would not, would not accept late work or we don't have makeup policy for quizzes and exams uh, unless there is some IBA policy for any, any specific thing. So we will go with that. Uh, I would imagine and assume that you would all abide by the uh, academic integrity uh, and honesty uh, issues, for example, you would not plagiarize, you would not cheat, you would not collude, and uh, when you are expected to do a certain thing, you would uh, be doing that honestly and so on and so forth. Um, with that, uh, let me provide you a list of topics that we will be covering in this class. So we will start with some basic preliminary and mathematical ideas that are required uh, to study this course. We will review some of those things and we will come back to those things when and whenever they are required. For example, we are doing randomized computation, maybe we'll talk about some probability over there. Uh, when we are doing some complexity classes and there are certain uh, related notions of functions and there, then we will discuss over there. <clears throat> when we are doing uh, circuits, then we will look at the Boolean algebra and maybe Boolean logic. So as, as time uh, comes and when uh, we are doing certain topics and we will try to look at the uh, basic or preliminary uh, mathematical ideas over there. Um, uh, apart from that, we will uh, spend some time in uh, covering the basic models of computation, starting from finite automata and Turing machines. And we will look at that what is meant by efficiency and running time of algorithms. Um, even though uh, the analysis and design of algorithms course is not uh, a prerequisite of this course, uh, but I assume that you have some idea about how to implement uh, algorithms, how to classify algorithms in different categories. Uh, you know that what is meant by the running time or the space complexity and things like that. Uh, then we will go into uh, directly go into class P and NP. Uh, then do reducibility and the completeness, and then uh, rest of the topics. <clears throat> so this is an oh, this is a this is a higher level overview of the topics that we will be covering, and this is the granular uh, uh, description uh, that how we will be doing week one till week fifteen or sixteen. So in this, um, <clears throat> I have mentioned that when when we will have our exams and when I will give out the homework. Uh, so we have uh, one first hourly exam sometime in week five. It could be either on Monday or Wednesday. We will decide it mutually that what is the best time for us. Um, I'm also teaching another course. So maybe we will have uh, exams on different days, but anyway, we will mutually agree on some uh, date. Uh, second hourly exam will be sometime in week number nine and third hourly would be either in week 15 or 16. I mentioned here is week 16, but maybe it could be in week 15. Uh, <clears throat> so we will start with preliminaries. Uh, so today I, I just explained what is the syllabus and we will, once we finish all of that, we will start uh, some basic uh, math required to understand, right? And maybe some uh, motivation uh, that why we need to study uh, complexity. Okay, with that, I would tell one, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, that this uh, syllabus or course outline will work as an agreement, a uh, document of agreement between you and me. So whenever you are in doubt, please refer to this document that what, what thing is happening in what time uh, and for what instrument we have, uh, how much percentage allocated and, and other things. So, so this is a, a, a working document. So I would be, making changes to this document from time to time. And whenever there's a change, I will let you know uh, so that you can refer it back and see that what are the changes, <clears throat> right? With this, uh, if there is any question, <clears throat> I can take your questions right. No questions? Everything clear? Yes, sir. Okay. I had a teacher uh, in college, I think, and she would say that 
that her teacher used to say, uh, is everything clear? And she would translate it in Urdu. And she would say, sab saaf ho gaya. So, sab saaf ho gaya. Bilkul saaf ho gaya. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, so let's let's move on. Okay. <clears throat> so let me share my screen. Uh, so I'm a little bit old school in a sense that I like to write on board uh, rather than creating slides. But since we are on, in online realm since almost two years, so I'll be doing it digitally and this is the digital uh, alternate uh, that I found. So I will write here on this digital blackboard. And um, so I, I like to write everything that I teach. So, so we'll be following this one. <clears throat> okay. Sir, will you be making this, uh, these pictures or these slides available to us so that we can yes. refer to it? Exactly. So what I will do, I will, uh, when, once we finish uh, uh, this class, uh, then for, for the first week since we have, uh, our classes will be online. So, so this recording will go to the YouTube. Uh, I will upload this uh, recording on YouTube and I will provide you the link of that YouTube video. I will uh, convert this, whatever that I would write here in a PDF document, I will upload it on uh, LMS. Right. So I hope that you all have the access to LMS. Uh, if you are registered for this course, I think you are automatically registered on LMS as well. But if you are not registered, please let me know and I will try to figure out that how to do that. Uh, but the, but, uh, but the end of this day, uh, maybe after a few hours of this, the end of the class, uh, most probably before five or six, I will upload everything on LMS and, YouTube <clears throat> and provide you the links to everything, including the course outline that I showed. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> so if there's no more questions, then we can start today's lecture. Uh, today's lecture will end at around 45, right? Anyway. Just give me a second. <clears throat> so, so we this course is called uh, computational complexity theory. So, if you if you omit this word computational, uh, then there is another study which is called complexity theory. And that complexity theory mainly concerns uh, dynamical systems. So if you uh, are, let's say, if you are a physicist or if you are a mechanical engineer, or uh, I mean, if you have studied robotics or something like that, uh, that complexity theory deals with dynamical systems, dynamic systems. So for example, uh, the systems which are, uh, which where you model chaos and, and you try to come up with partial differential equations and so on and so forth. Uh, but when we append uh, this word with the prefix computational, uh, then mainly we concern with, with the course that we will be doing today, <clears throat> right? So, uh, so this computational complexity, which has this word computation embedded in it, it is, it is a very important word, okay? So people had some idea about computation since very long time ago. For example, even pe people around like 2000 years ago or maybe before that, uh, people knew certain ideas of, about computation. <clears throat> even though their ideas and their concepts about computation were not as refined uh, or, or precise as we now computation, now, as, as now we know computation, uh, but they knew uh, some things about computation, right? Uh, for example, um, imagine that that in ancient Babylon or in, in ancient Greek or in any civilization that you can think of, uh, people had number systems, right? They could count uh, 
starting from one and going all the way uh, till 100 and maybe 500, sometimes even bigger numbers. And, and they had this basic idea to add numbers or to multiply numbers and subtract numbers uh, to a point that even Greeks had, um, Greeks knew how to find out, uh, let's say, square roots of, of numbers. For example, when Pythagorean uh, found this interesting result, when he found that if we have a right angle triangle such that the base length is one and the height is one, then the the length of uh, the hypotenuse is square root, the square root of two. So they knew that this number is square root of two and they had a very uh, elegant geometrical proof for that, maybe not algebraic proof, that, but they had geometrical proof that what is this square root of two. And based on it, they define um, irrational numbers and, and they figure out that what is square root square root of two and how to compute it. And before that, uh, they did not know that there exists any number which is an irrational number. So they tried to, to, to find out that <clears throat> whether this number is rational or irrational and they proved that this is irrational number. And now we know that this is an elegant proof that why square root of two is irrational. And similarly, they uh, sometimes they had other aspects, for example. So this, this square root of two comes from the solution of algebraic equations. For example, if I say that, <clears throat> x squared minus four is equal to zero, uh, then this leads to this equation because then it means that x is plus minus square root of two, right? So this uh, is the, uh, uh, the underlying geometric issues. But once when they were solving these, uh, this, these algebraic issues, they also had uh, something like that, x squared plus one equal to zero. So they already had figured out how to solve linear equations, but uh, when they had quadratic equation, and if I give you this equation, then they were stumbled out. They could not proceed because there is no real number solution for this equation. So it's impossible to find the value of x in real number terms, which will satisfy, right? So there is no real solution for this equation. Uh, there is a solution for this equation, but that's not real. So if I say that x is imaginary number, uh, then it is up. perfect. Uh, so okay, yes. X, this is X, it should be X square minus two, right? Equals to zero. Oh yes, sorry. Thank you. X square minus two, not four. Four will give you plus minus two. <laughs> sorry, thank you. But when they, they had something similar where rather than uh, negative numbers, they had positive numbers. Then they figured out that no, they cannot solve it. So, so first uh, they knew that this number cannot be an integer. So there is no integer solution for this. They have to invent new numbers. And then they found that it is impossible to have even a real number solution. So they have to invent uh, imaginary and complex numbers. But still, all of that has an underlying computational aspect, right? So you are computing numbers. You are trying to figure out how to multiply numbers, how to find the square roots, how to add numbers and so on. So the people in, in those times, they had some rudimentary or some basic understanding of, of computation. They knew how to carry out those computations. Uh, even though they, they did not formalize that what is computation and it was almost impossible to formalize it till uh, the time of uh, 20th century, uh, people had some idea that what is uh, what is computation uh, to a point that in so there is a very famous um, uh, mathematical congress which happened I think in 1900 and it happened I think in Austria and in this that mathematical conference uh, there was a very famous mathematician of that time his name was David Hilbert. So David Hilbert was a visionary. He, he was an amazing mathematician. He was a German mathematician, amazing mathematician. And, and he had results in so many different areas of mathematics. He has worked in many different areas of mathematics. So, uh, and he was very prominent by that time. So in 1900, in that mathematical conference, David Hilbert came up with a list of props. And I think in that list, there were 23 different problems. And he presented those, uh, that list of 23 problems to that Congress of Mathematicians sitting in Austria in 1900 and said that I would hope to find the problem, uh, solution of these problems, uh, all of these problems in my lifetime, but I would 
imagine that maybe in next 100 year mathematicians would be able to solve these problems and some of these problems are actually very difficult problems most of them are very difficult problems uh, but on this list there was a problem which is now famously called the 10th problem or hilbert's 10th problem uh, was a problem which uh, which was a mathematical problem and which is still a mathematical problem uh, but that problem actually led to the complete development of computer science. So, so the whole computer science that we now know is due to an attempt to solve the problem, which is the 10th problem on that list. Uh, it is incorrect to say that if David did not publish uh, this list, we would not have computer science. No, it is not. Um, this is not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to say is that that this 10th problem is, was the back of the mind of all the people who were trying to resolve these issues. And, and, and the people who were trying to resolve these issues in the 20th, 20th century, were, there were so many problems. So there was this person Post, uh, then we had Church, then we had Turing, uh, we had Gödel, and there were so many other problems, uh, so many other people who were trying to figure out uh, these issues. So Church was a mathematician because there was no computer science at that time. Uh, at, at a, he was a professor at, uh, at Princeton University, New Jersey, and Turing was uh, Turing was studying at Princeton University and was a PhD student, a PhD candidate, uh, working with uh, Church, Alonzo Church. <clears throat> And in 1936, they came up with some understanding about how to proceed with such kind of issues. So what David was asking was actually a definition for an algorithm. So he did not say, I want a definition of an algorithm, but whatever he was asking required a definition of algorithm. And Turing actually, uh, came up with a working definition. And with Church, uh, they did not just come up with, uh, with, with the definition of algorithm. Uh, they come up with a statement, which is now called church Turing thesis, which makes the basis of all uh, understanding of computation and complexity that we, that we take as granted. Uh, so we will cover this church steering thesis in a little bit more detail later on, but church steering thesis was one of the uh, starting point where uh, all of that started and um, uh, together church and Turing come independently came up with, with uh, definitions and, and models and uh, abstract abstraction of mathematics, uh, which, which started this new wonderful field of computer science that we now know. Uh, so for, for Turing, we know that we have Turing machines. So Turing was responsible for creating these abstract machines. He did not call them Turing machines, of course. Uh, people who came after Turing started calling a Turing machine. Now they are famously called a Turing machine. And Church uh, come up with a new idea, uh, which is called uh, Lambda Calculus. So in this course, we will look at Turing machines, but probably will not look at lambda calculus. This is uh, beyond uh, the scope of this course, uh, but if you are interested, you can, um, you can look at lambda calculus. And if you are uh, familiar with JavaScript, if you are familiar with JavaScript, then there are books which talk about lambda calculus from the perspective or point of view of JavaScript. So JavaScript is a, is a wonderful language which has it's very strange language, uh, by the way, uh, but it's, it's, it's very amazing and, and, and wonderful that it provides multiple possible syntaxes for the same, same kind of thing. Uh, so some of the syntaxes are very similar to the other programming languages, but there's for, for every possible statement, there is a syntax, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is based in Lambda calculus. So if you write a Lambda calculus statement, uh, you can translate it in JavaScript and, and vice versa. <coughs> So if you if you are familiar with JavaScript, uh, you can study lambda calculus very easily. Uh, 
Uh, but we will not cover it in this class. We will cover some parts from Keyring machines. I hope that you already know what are Keyring machines, uh, but we will anyway cover uh, the basic things of our Keyring machines. So far, so good. Any questions? What was the actual uh, tenth problem? Do you remember the actual? The yeah, yeah. So the tenth problem. So tenth problem was something like this. So I can I can write an instance of a tenth problem. It's not exactly the tenth problem, but tenth problem look uh, look like this. So for example, if mm -hmm. I write, uh, sir, I have seen internet where they have written the words say exactly. Oh, yeah, they say given a Diophantine equation, can you decide is there an integral solution for it or not? Is there a method to decide this or not? Exactly. So it's it's a it's finding a solution to Diophantine equation. So Diophantine equations are general equations, but I will write one equation which is definitely Diophantine, but not Diophantine or like like that. So for example, if I have a variable x and I say that I have x power n, and I have y, and I say it's y power n, and I say is equal to let's say z power uh, o. It's not a good idea. L, for example. Okay. So I want to find out um, a solution of this kind of equation, uh, where I want x, y, and z, and n and m and l all to be integers. One such instance is basically the Pythagorean uh, uh, equation, which is a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, right? So if whenever we have a right angle triangle, we know that integer solutions exist. <clears throat> uh, for example, if the length is uh, three and four, we know that it is, um, this is equal to five. So we know that three squared plus four squared is equal to five squared. So, so all these numbers are integer. So X is integer, Y is integer, Z is integer, N is integer, M is integer, L is integer. So N, M, L could be different numbers. They could be same numbers. So we need uh, non-trivial equations. And if I, uh, if, if, if I simplify it further, I would say that I, I need some a solution to this general equation, A power N plus B power N is equal to C power N, where N is greater than uh, let's say two, and A, B, C, and N are all integers. So we want to find out a solution. So he wanted to find out a solution and he, he Hilbert asked that uh, maybe by the end of uh, 20th century, we will, so, so he did not doubt that such solutions do, do not exist. Uh, so he belonged to a kind of school of mathematicians uh, which assumed that everything is possible to, uh, we can solve everything. It may be possible that, uh, it, it may be the case that we are not possible to solve, it is impossible to solve it now, but maybe after some time we will be able to solve it. So he belonged to that kind of uh, school. Um, so he asked that question that let's devise a method of finding such a solution. For example, if I have a very simple uh, quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx uh, plus c is equal to zero, uh, then we know there's an effective way to find the roots of this equation. And we know that there are two possible uh, solutions, x1, x2, and which are minus b plus minus square root of b squared minus four ac divided by two. It doesn't talk about integer solutions, but there is a solution, right? Mathematicians at that time already knew that uh, if we have a equation which, uh, a polynomial equation which, which with a degree five and above, it's impossible to come up with this simple formula, right? Even for quad, uh, cubic equations, it's, it's almost difficult to find out uh, a simple formula for, uh, I mean, equations of power four, almost impossible, but for five and above, uh, we cannot find a general solution. But, Hilbert wanted to have more than that. He said, okay, I, I just don't want a solution. I want an integral solution. So come up with a method which will, uh, where we plug in these values and uh, we will get the output. So he did not say input and plug in and output uh, because the notion of algorithm or a computer program or computer for that, uh, that matter was not developed. So he, he said that come up with an effective way of finding 
uh, or solving such kind of equations. So, so this is exactly what he wanted. So what he was trying to say was find an algorithm which will solve. And nobody knew what is meant by an algorithm, right? So, so there were some concepts of algorithm. And if you go back in history, we know that the word algorithm itself is derived from the last name of uh, Persian mathematician, Muhammad Nusa al-Khwarzmi. Uh, al-Khwarzmi is, uh, so this algorithm is, is a distorted version of the word al-Khwarzmi. So al-Khwarzmi, there was a, there's a place in Persia called Khwarzm. So anyone from uh, belonging to that place is called al-Khwarzmi. Uh, so he's, he's Muhammad bin Musa from Khwarzm. Uh, so this algorithm is a distorted version of uh, Khwarzmi. Uh, anyway, so people knew a certain idea of, uh, uh, of, of al uh, algorithm. For example, people already knew Euclid's uh, algorithm uh, to find out the GCD of two numbers, right? So, so Hilbert wanted some, something similar. He, he wanted a procedure, a mechanical thing, where you carry out certain calculations and computation and at the end, you will get the result. So he would asking for coming up with, with, with an effective procedure or an algorithm, but the motion was not defined completely. So Turing and Church uh, define uh, what is an algorithm. And if we have an algorithm, what does it mean by having an algorithm? So how does it impact computation? How does it carry out computation? So we need to, even before we define algorithm, we need to define what is computation. So Church and uh, Turing define what is computation. But the problem was that uh, that definition is circular. For example, we define what is computation in terms of algorithm, and we define algorithm in terms of computation. So it is impossible to separate these, these two things uh, completely. And uh, so far, we don't know. And that's why we still call it a church theory thesis and not a church theory theorem. Um, so we have a very good understanding that what is an algorithm, what is computation, what is computable, uh, but we cannot separate the two concepts precisely and we need to define them in terms of each other. And um, actually we are very arrogant and uh, self-centric. We imagine that this is a universal, um, universal kind of thing and whatever description we have about algorithm would be the same for everyone uh, in this universe. So, so we imagine uh, this is the case, but not, not necessarily same. Anyway, that's a little bit rambling. Uh, uh, any other question? Any further question? Sir, I think Hilbert, the 10th problem, the scandal, he was asking, अगर डायोफेंटेन इक्वेशन है तो उसका इंटीग्रल सॉल्यूशन है या नहीं है मतलब वो तो सॉल्व करने के लिए बात नहीं कर रहा था वो डिसाइडेबिलिटी का क्वेश्चन पूछ रहा था ना कि इसको डिसाइड किया जा सकता है या नहीं तो वहीं पे मेरे ख्याल से ट्यूरिंग की जो ट्यूरिंग मशीन्स हैं और उसके जो हम डिसाइडेबिलिटी प्रॉब्लम होता है वो यहीं से मेरे ख्याल से डिराइव करना है जिस तरह हम बता रहे थे डिसाइडेबिलिटी से ट्रू ट्रू बट डिसाइड ओके इवन इन इवन टू डिसाइड यू नीड टू सॉल्व राइट सो हाउ वुड यू डिसाइड इफ यू कैन नॉट सॉल्व so 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 it's it's not um, the same thing but it, it is very similar for example if you are able to solve then you are also able to decide right but maybe if you are able to decide you may not solve it but there is something there which can help exactly. you to decide exactly so by that time hilbert knew that there are certain equations for which he could not find a solution right so he could not find a solution so he wanted an effective way to figuring out that if a solution exists so if a solution exists then the next question would be what is that solution right <clears throat> so we just don't want yeah. to find out or know that there exists a solution we are also interested in finding what is the solution so of course the first attempt uh, the first thing that that he was interested in was to find out whether they are decidable or not uh, but once that's decidable we need a solution but on the other hand if you can solve uh, certain something then definitely you know you have already resolved the decidability issue <coughs> right great uh, any other question okay 
So in this course, we will not talk about computation. We will talk about complexity most of the time. Okay. So what is complexity? So, so computation means what is computable? Okay, what are the things which we can compute and what are the things which cannot be computed? For example, if you are coming with some background in Automata, uh, you know that we declared some problems as uncomputable or undecidable, such as uh, halting problem is undecidable. Uh, so we know about that, right? In this course, we will not be interested in that. We said, that, okay, imagine that some, we know what is computable. Imagine that this is the whole circle uh, of problems which are computable, right? Now, how we can classify these problems into different classes? Okay, different classes of easy to solve, not easy to solve, and so on. Okay, so these are all the classes that we will come up with. We will game. Uh, we will give uh, technical names to these classes. And there are not just two classes, there are many different classes that we will look at. And so, so the, the objective of this course is to study this part of uh, the, the picture. That is where we try to figure out a classification scheme where we put different problems into different classes. We come up with a relationship between these classes and, and, and we come up with an effective manner, an effective way of figuring out that how to put a problem, a new problem into one of those classes. <clears throat> okay, clear. Okay. So, we have done the last semester the design and analysis of algorithms course. So, mm -hmm. how will this course be different from it? But we have learned different <coughs> techniques for the problem. So, how will this problem be different from it? But we have learned different techniques for the problem. So, how will this problem be different from it? But we have learned different techniques for the problem. A very good question, and uh, that's exactly what I was about to uh, say. The next, so uh, <clears throat> when we study computer science, uh, when we study theoretical computer science, we study algorithms and computation and automata. Uh, we make one very interesting uh, uh, notational uh, understanding about something, which we we distinguish between a problem and an algorithm. So there is a significant difference between these two things. What is a problem and what is an algorithm? For example, in the course of uh, design analysis of algorithms or even any other course of programming or data structure, we mainly concern with algorithms. Okay, and we do not concern with problems as much. We do concern, we do talk about problems, but mainly we concern about algorithms. Okay, for example, Sorting is a problem. Okay. Quick sort is an algorithm. Searching is a problem. Binary search is an algorithm. Right? Merge sort is an algorithm. Heap sort is an algorithm. Bubble sort is an algorithm. Binary search is an algorithm. Linear search is an algorithm. So these are all searching algorithms. This is a problem. These are the algorithms. So when we talk about problem, we are interested in the complete class of that problem, not just one way to solve it, right? And that's important. When we study design and analysis of algorithms, we look at the problem, let's say sorting, and we say that, okay, we for sorting, we have, let's say you study four different algorithms, quick sort, much sort, and a bubble sort and selection sort, and maybe one more sort. Uh, and once you study those sorting algorithms, you uh, figure out that, using mathematical analysis that which algorithm is faster, which algorithm is the fastest, and what are the conditions where one algorithm uh, performs better than the other algorithm, right? Or what are the conditions where algorithms perform worse than the others, okay? Or what are the average cases uh, for each of the algorithms? So over there, we design efficient algorithms and we try to figure out the analysis of that algorithm. We evaluate those algorithms empirically or mathematically. 
uh, but one when and we also learn about different techniques for example what is divide and conquer what is dynamic programming and other uh, what are greedy approaches and approximation algorithms and so on and so forth but once we come to complexity theory once we talk about problems we are usually not interested in the specific algorithms we are interested in a generalizing bounds on the problems themselves for example without creating any algorithm without writing any code i can tell you that whenever you are dealing with sorting you know that the this is the lower bound for sorting and not just any sorting but comparison based sort this lower bound tells you that no matter what kind of algorithm you use any algorithm that is already known to us or any algorithm that you may invent tomorrow or next year or next 500 years if that algorithm is a comparison based sorting algorithm this is going to be the lower bound you cannot improve this lower bound okay so that thing is mainly concerned with the complexity and computation theory not with the algorithms okay so there is the significant difference between a problem and the algorithm so uh, over here uh, we will be interested in uh, the classification of problems rather than the classification of algorithms so when we talk about sorting we just talk about sorting without mentioning which sorting algorithm we are talking about when we talk about searching we will be interested in searching when we talk about uh, some graph algorithms we will be interested in graph algorithms right and we will not stay there actually we will go one step further and we will go uh, uh, at a higher level and we say that all those problems regardless whether they are sorting or searching or graph algorithms if the running time is so and so we will put them in a class a if the running time is between this and that or more than that on certain uh, with certain conditions we will put that in class b and then class c and class d and then we will study the properties of that class of uh, algorithms and that class of problems without mentioning the problems themselves without mentioning any different algorithm for those problems we will talk about the class itself not any problem that class and so on and so forth so this is the difference between the design and analysis of algorithm and this uh, this course does that answer your question question thank you sir samaj mein great so <clears throat> for example uh, uh, there is a, an important um, problem called matrix multiplication problem so when this matrix multiplication problem was um, initially considered by computer scientists to to improve at that time computers were not fast enough and um, and they did not have enough memory that they, they were not capable of doing a lot of computation at, at, at once um but now we know that we have very powerful computers and we have so many applications where matrix multiplication is an integral part it's it's one of the most important part, task in in that, those applications almost all machine learning applications deep learning and neural network and and many other computer vision and and uh, graphics application require multiplying large matrices and uh and and i'm talking about matrices where the sizes of matrices is not just 5 by 5 or 10 by 10 uh the size of these matrices is like 100 million by million or 10 million by 10 million so these are usually uh, these are really really big matrices right so if you have such big matrices if you want to add them it will take a lot of time if you want to multiply it will take even much more time than addition right and and we know that if we have two matrices of size n by n and n by n so let's say we have a matrix a and we have a matrix b and both these matrices are are of size n by n then we know then there is a straightforward upper bound for the matrix multiplication algorithm which is o of n q right so we can do it uh not uh, more than of n cube operations so whatever number of operations that you will uh, your algorithm uh, or your solution will uh, employ uh, it would not be more than n cube but n cube is a lot uh, it, it's it's such a big number especially when n is a big number right 
you can see that n cube grows much faster. It, it's, it's a very quick, quickly growing function. So n cube is a big number. And uh, when n is a big number, then n cube grows even uh, faster, right? So there was this race in 1960s and 70s uh, where a mathematician and computer scientists tried to figure out that how to improve this algorithm, right? And then they improved it uh, from n cube to O of n uh, 2.8. Then later on, it was improved to O of n 2.37. So I think this is the best uh, bound that is known. We know that the lower bound for matrix multiplication is n squared. So you cannot do better than n squared. And we already know an n cube algorithm. So there is a there is so many uh, I mean so many things which we which we can have between two and three. Uh, and people have come up with uh, as low as two point three six and as much as two point eight uh, algorithms which which multiply matrices, right? Uh, so this is one of the areas where. Uh, which is at the at, at the boundary of both problem and algorithm, which is at boundary of both uh, complexity theory and uh, design analysis algorithm, right? So we 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 do this thing. So we we say that this is more efficient algorithm than this one, and this is more efficient algorithm than this one. Maybe this is the least efficient algorithm, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> so we will talk about these things. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Just give me a second. Anyway. <clears throat> uh, no, uh, no questions? Also. So in computational complexity theory, we are interested in classification. Classification of problems rather than algorithms. Okay. And once we come up with the classification, we will try to come up with uh, connections and relationship between different classes. Right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. So let's um, let's talk about um, some uh, ideas that which we require from um, theory of automata. So let us uh, let's see how many students we have in this class right now. So one, two, three, four, five. So are you all familiar with finite automata? Yes, sir. Completely, fairly familiar with finite automata, all the mathematical uh, description and also the construction and drawing of those automata and knowing what are the uh, regular languages and things like that. Are you yes, all familiar? Sir. How many of you are also familiar with push down automata and maybe Turing machines? Push down automata is not the Turing machine. Do you know Turing machine? Yes or no? Yes, yes, Turing machine. So you know Turing machine, right? So is it the case with everyone? Okay. Okay, so if it is the case, then we will quickly go through everything and it will be, we will figure it out. Okay, so before we go into finite automata, uh, so let's do some uh, preliminary things, uh, which will, I think, refresh your memory about uh, so many things as well. So <clears throat> whenever we uh, talk about languages, formal languages in automata theory, uh, we talk about strings, okay? And we talk about language. Okay, and we talk about alphabet. So let me define what is an alphabet before I define a string, before I define a language. So what is an alphabet? 
An alphabet is basically a set of characters, which is the building block or which provide building blocks to construct strings. Example. Let's say, and we usually refer alphabet as capital sigma letter, right? So suppose I have a sigma, which consists of zero and one. So this is my alphabet. So an alphabet is basically a finite set. And uh, this finite set contains basic building block. And we can use these basic building block to construct strings. So if I say that I have a sigma, which contains zero and one, then I can construct all binary strings, okay? All binary strings on zero and one. For example, I know that zero is a string, one is a string, zero one is a string, one zero is a string, one one is a string, one zero zero is a string, one zero one is a string, and so on and so forth. All these strings are strings of zeros and one. So we can collect these strings in a set, right? All of them, or we can talk about some sets, subsets. For example, if I say that A is this complete set of strings, then I can think about a subset of the set A. And I say that B is just all the strings, which are zero, one, zero, one, I'm uh, sorry. One, zero, and one, one. <clears throat> <clears throat> so this is definitely a subset of the set A, right? So this is a set that contains just four elements, zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. So we can define any uh, subset that you want. That subset could be a finite set, that subset could be an infinite set, and so on and so forth. We can clearly describe what the set B is. So this set B contains a string X, which is from the sigma star, or which is from, uh, yeah, of course, from sigma star such that uh, the value of x is less than four, between zero and four, right? So we know that if the number is binary number, then it has a decimal value, which is between zero and one. Now, so when, so I think, I hope it is clear that what is an alphabet, an alphabet is basically a finite set that contains a building block, which we can use to construct strings. A string is basically a sequence of alphabets, so sequence of characters from the alphabet, that sequence can have one element, two elements, three elements, four elements, and so on and so forth. So this is a string. This is a string, this is a string, and all of these are string. Whenever we have a strings, a collection of strings, a set of strings, is called a language. For example, A is a language, B is a language. Is this in clear? What is a language? Yes, sir. Okay, so, so we start with the alphabet. Alphabet contains basic building blocks. And with those basic building blocks, we create strings. And once we have multiple strings, any set of strings, it could be a finite set, it could be an infinite set, that, finite, uh, that set of a string is called a language. Okay, and whenever we have a language, uh, we have an associated problem. So for example, if I say L is a language, then we say that L has an associated problem. Computational problem. Okay, so when we do theory of automata and formal languages, we mostly consider those sets of strings as languages. But when we do complexity theory, sometimes we consider them as language, other times we call them a problem, okay? And not just any problem, we call them decision problems. I will, I will differentiate uh, what is meant by decision problem and if there is any other type of problem later on, uh, but we usually call them a decision problem, <clears throat> okay? So don't worry if you, uh, if you 
haven't seen these terms before, we will cover them uh, in detail. Clear? <clears throat> okay, so um, whenever we have a language N, okay? So we know that if, if L is a language, then L is a set of strings, right? Imagine there is a sigma, which is the alphabet, and I say L is a language that contains strings X, such that X is one of the string from the sigma star. So when I put a sigma star, it's a clean operation. So you know that how to carry out that operation, uh, such that P of X, okay? What is this P of X? P of X is a property. some property. So this is a predicate that we can apply to any strength. For example, I can define this P of X. This is just an example. Consider a language A that contains some string X such that X belongs to Sigma star and my Sigma is just zero one. And I have P of X and that P of X is defined as <coughs> X is a uh, is is odd. Okay, so this is property is that X is odd. So what would be the strings in this A? One would be there, one one would be there, one zero one would be there, one uh, what else would be there? One 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 would be there, and so on. All these strings would be in set A. So this set A is a language which contains all even numbers represented in binding. Now, whenever we have a language L, some language L over some alphabet, okay, we need to figure out a membership query. And what do we mean by membership query? For example, just consider some sigma in uh, for simplicity, we make it zero one. Let's consider some language L over sigma star. That is every string in this language L will be a binary string. Now we do not know exactly what are the strings in this language L, but all these strings are binary. So we can say that I want to figure out if a certain string X belongs to the language L or not. So this question is called a membership question. Okay, so we need to figure out how to answer this question. In order to answer this question, we develop the complete complexity theory. Some, uh, so for some languages, this membership query can be answered very quickly. And we can only use finite automata to, to answer that question. For some, uh, member, for some languages that, that membership query requires to create more sophisticated machines like pushed on automata. And for some questions, uh, we need to figure out we need to construct the most powerful machine that we know, which is a Turing machine, and we can solve. And there are some languages for which it is impossible to construct any machine which can answer that membership query, right? So, so the problems where we classify languages where it is possible to answer that question in that particular model or that particular model goes in the automata theory. And in this course, we say, imagine that all uh, questions, all languages, for, for all languages, this question is answerable, which is that we know uh, it is possible to answer this question. And then let's see which machines, which model answer these questions and let's classify those things, right? So we mainly be concerned with answering uh, these membership uh, queries, okay? And that has an equivalent understanding with decision problems. And sometimes we refer them as language membership problems, uh, queries, and sometimes we call them decision problems. So I will explain what is decision problem in detail in next class, and I will stop it here. So any questions so far? So I will end this class here because I think we are already beyond time. Any questions? No, sir, everything's clear. Okay, great. So I think uh, we can end it here and I hope that all of you
uh, will be there in next class and maybe uh, some more students will be there. Uh, and from next class, we will start, start uh, the proper formal understanding. Yes, there is some, some raised hand. Who raised your, raised their hand? Yes, I G. Yeah, can you hear me? No, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yes. I don't want to hold anyone back, but uh, I this is just like some kind of an aside question that I was just wondering why uh, why do we generally teach theory uh, of automata starting from uh, these uh, finite state machines and finite state automata and then going to CFG and then going to Turing machine. I, I just was curious as to why. Uh, is this a syllabus thing that has been set by universities or who has come up with this? Okay, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I think usually in any course that we teach, uh, we go from um, easier things to, to difficult things. Um, so finite automata can only answer membership queries for a very specific, very restricted class of languages, which we call regular languages. And regular languages are very easy to comprehend and understand, uh, and, and it's it's very easy to describe those uh, regular languages. And finite automata is the simplest computational model that we can think of. Uh, so we usually start with finite automata because that's easy. It has, I think, uh, some historical uh, baggage that why do we start this by, by finite automata? I think in my opinion, uh, maybe it is not necessary to have use finite automata and we can start directly from computing machines. Uh, that is possible. Uh, but there is a problem with that. And that is once you start with Turing machine, then it's usually difficult to talk about context-free languages or regular languages. And once you start with a restricted model of computation, it's easier to build on top of it by adding more complexity rather than removing complexity from Turing machine and making it more restricted. Uh, so I think that's just a, a matter of, uh, I mean, a teaching strategy that how you teach it. Usually it has been taught like that, uh, but yeah, you can change it the way you like. Uh, but there is one, uh, I think there is one uh, understanding that why we go with that one, uh, and that is uh, many students who take a theory of automata or any course, similar course, uh, they take it because they need to take a compiler construction course in the next semester or in the next year. And compiler construction has an important uh, part, which which is dealt, uh, which, which is connected with the uh, lexical CFGs. analysis. Uh, yes, CFG is, is, is a later part. And before CFG, it's just the um, tokenization. So this tokenization can be done very easily with a simple DFA, <clears throat> with a simple deterministic finite automata. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence over there. And uh, it uh, actually also uh, matters to every programmer who has to deal with uh, command line parameter. For example, if you want to write uh, uh, an application which, which takes command line parameters and there are multiple options of command line, then you would need to parse it. And before parsing, you need to done, do some tokenization. And that can be easily done with, with DFAs. So maybe that's why DFA is, is I mean, is teachers spend more time on DFAs and explain it in detail. Uh, but I don't see any theoretical limitation apart from the fact that it's the simplest model, so it's easier to uh, to understand and relate it with other some real real world applications. Probably that answered it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other question? Okay, uh, in that case, thank you very much for your time. And I hope all of you will be back uh, during Wednesday's class. So, but, so in the meantime, please take care and Khuda from my side. Khuda Khuda